Now, there's been some real progress uh, with vision. Uh, for example, I know that Google is working on a self-driving car. Right. A car that drives itself. It's got 360-degree cameras mounted on the roof. Right. Now, what does it take to make that work? Because it's not enough just to have a picture. You have to interpret what that picture is looking at. You have to judge speed and distance and control the car and know when to turn and when to brake. Right. And there's a, a new product that's being released by one of the car companies that actually looks at the lines um, on the center of the road and the side of the road and can determine if you're going to if you're falling asleep because you're you're not doing what you should be doing and it's all done by looking with a camera and going into a computer because if cars could drive better than people that might uh, reduce accidents and i guess the cost comes that once you solve the technical problems it's not that expensive you know to replicate them are there any other functions that we usually do ourselves that maybe uh, we would have robots do for us in the near future. Well, the the Roomba that has the capability to sweep the floor, and there's another model that can actually scrub the floor. There's a, two two other companies that are making one that uh, you put soap in it, and it goes and scrubs the floor and dries it. Is there um, anything that'll cook your meals? I haven't seen one of those yet, but that's probably not too far away, actually. And how do you communicate with these robots? So, for example, with that Asimo robot we just saw, I'm guessing that the guy has a little electronic control panel, but are there any robots that you can talk to and it'll understand your voice commands? Um, I haven't seen one, but the interesting thing about controlling robots these days is the electronics, this is actually a 2.4 gigahertz remote control receiver that probably 10 years ago would have cost $100. Now uh, you can buy them for $7. So the price of, of parts to build robots is really coming down in a hurry. Now, you've invented a lot of things over the course of your career, and we have some slides of some of the things you've done. So we're going to show those. Uh, okay, so there's the first slide. It looks like a family of R2-D2. Yeah. R2-D2 is the, probably the most famous robot in the world, and it's, after 35 years, still very popular. There's a group called R2-D2 Robot Builders Club that has 5,000 members worldwide that build R2-D2s just for the heck of it. S most of them are spending four or $5,000 building R2-D2s. The, the big one there is a foot shorter than the real R2-D2. The next one down is uh, about 18 inches, and then it goes down to the small one that's about 2 inches. Um, I'm looking for one that's halfway between those, so I need one that's about 8 inches to complete my small now, robot now thing there. Now, did you there. build these, or did you No, I bought these, but you, you know, it's interesting. You cannot buy a remote-controlled R2-D2. There, there's no company that makes it. I don't know if... Lucas doesn't want you to buy them or what, but I bought the big one there, started off life right. as a trash can, and right. I took all the stuff out and put a, a radio in it so right. I can remote control it. And um, so, so that's so really the only move. way you're going to be able to get it to move remotely is do it yourself. Now, we have a picture of another invention of yours, which is actually a small helicopter. Could we see that? Okay, there this, it is. Yeah, this helicopter was designed originally to hunt for mines, and it had an onboard uh, electronics package that would actually d detect mines and then have a way to uh, remotely detonate them. And that was about 20 years ago, and mm -hmm. since then, there really hasn't been much further uh, development along that field. Uh, most of the mine destruction things in the world are still tanks with big flailing chains on the front of them. But um, that was a coaxial helicopter. Um, Meaning two blades that go in opposite directions? Right, and that way it's uh, it, one of the motors cancels out the other one torque so it doesn't spin. Um, I've actually uh, built a new one. This one is the same idea. It has two motors with counter-rotating blades and a camera on it. And this could be used in SWAT team operations where the unit could be flown 100, 200, 300 feet above a building or th through a window or whatever. And it's not restricted like the one uh, that is made um, 
called Parrot, I think it is. Uh, the, that one has problems that can't be used by police departments. This one is completely remote controllable that uh, you'll be able to... Uh, is that internet enabled or does the controller have to be close enough to it so that it can receive yeah, the signal? That, this one is flown with one of these. You fly it by going up and then turning it right and left. Um, the, um, what altitude would you fly that at, like about the height of a house? Yeah, probably 50 to 100 feet, um, although it could go 1,000 feet if you wanted to, but then the camera doesn't pick up much detail. And this run on batteries? It runs on LiPo batteries for about 15 minutes. And um, this is another one. This I didn't design this helicopter. I designed this one, but I didn't design this one. This one is an off-the-shelf helicopter. What's unique about this is it has the world's smallest camera with a transmitter on it. This camera is weighs less than a half an ounce, and this will send video 250 feet wirelessly. So you could actually fly this to do some kind of surveillance, although th this one is very subjected to wind, it, 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 it won't work. Whereas this one is fairly immune to wind because it doesn't have much side force to, to, to be pick, picked up. A lot of the earlier ones had a lot of bulk, and when the wind hit them, they would tend to do this. So is that a small camera your creation? This is, uh, this is actually an off-the-shelf camera that uh -huh. you can buy for about $50 or uh -huh. $40 now. But this little one that was attached to the small helicopter. That one, this one is one that I, I came up with, right. And uh, this one also runs on 3 volts, which is another thing that is needed. Uh, this has a 3-volt LiPo battery in it. So um, this, this camera, all of the ones you buy for about 30 to 40 50 dollars run on uh, 8 to 12 volts. So it's impossible to use it on some of the little helicopters. Now we have another image related to your uh, helicopter, the triangular-shaped helicopter. Like I said, it looks like a brochure or a poster you're describing what it does. Uh, yeah, that was the uh, brochure we made up for uh, showing it to the military and to uh, uh, several shows that we went to. Yeah, I would think there'd be a demand for it. There's a hundred million mines in the world, and they keep adding another million every year, so there's a really big need to be able to get rid of, right. of mines in the ground. Maybe more than one at a time. That's right. Maybe they, okay, there's one more picture of another device that you created, if we could see that one. This is my answer to the Segway. You know, Segways are two, three thousand dollars, and the reason is they self-balance, so they have a lot of electronics and a lot of power required to do that. This one could sell for $300, not $3,000, because it's got three wheels. But what does it not do that the Segway does? Um, it's not as cool. Okay. <laughs> it looks like you could fall off. I mean, the platform isn't very large. <laughs> so um, so what, what's your favorite invention of all the things you've invented? What's the thing you're most proud of? Um, well, that uh, helicopter that, that uh, kills uh, in-ground mines is, is pretty Im impressive mm -hmm. as far as what I remember doing. Um, the things that made the most money are also memorable, like I invented the first MPEG digital video recorder, and I've got thousands of those in Las Vegas and casinos, so that one rates right up on the top mm -hmm. of the, the list. Um, some of these newer uh, robots that uh, we have over here hopefully will will be uh, also very profitable and I'm expecting that that T-Bot is going to be a, a real winner because the closest competitor to that sells for six or seven thousand dollars and there's one that sells for fifteen thousand so at twenty five hundred it's it's a real bargain. Yeah. Do you have a whole company with lots of people working for you or do you basically do it all yourself? I do most of it myself and I have a company that does uh, contact manufacturing in Fremont and uh, they've been able to build, if I needed 500 digital video recorders, they, they built 500 in about a week and a half. Is there any specialty you have with inventing, like in the introduction to the show I mentioned that you've done a lot of low cost things, you're looking for a mass market by selling things that are uh, simpler and less expensive than your competitors? That's what I kind of uh, specialize in, is taking the idea that may have been somebody else's idea and they sell it for big bucks and I convert it into a really low-cost version. 
We just have about one minute left. Do you have any advice for any young person who might be thinking about becoming an inventor? It's a, it's a tough way to go, <laughs> but it's worth it. I mean, and you know, you, you need to uh, develop a, a lot of skills, not on you know, computer programming, um, machine shop, take machine shop. You, you learn a lot of how to manipulate uh, metals. Um, there's a there's a lot of uh, of uh, electronics, so all of the electronics uh, courses that you can take are, are really worthwhile. Okay, great, and we are going to have to wrap on that note because we are just a bit out of time. This is Marty Wasserman for Future Talk. Um, my guest today has been Chuck Colby, the well-known inventor who's been doing it since about the age of ten. Be sure to visit our website www.futuretalk.net for Future Talk. We'll see you next time. And that's a wrap.